Okay, so let's kick this, this thing off tonight. Thank you guys so much for joining us virtually for the Barefoot King book launch. Um, my name is Caitlin and I'm a publicist for Bala Kids, which is the publisher for the book you are, will be introduced to shortly. So tonight's event is a benefit for Dog Eared Books, a wonderful bookstore in San Francisco and a favorite stop of the authors. So we would love for you to consider supporting Dog Eared Books by purchasing tonight's book through Bookshop, which is a website that supports independent bookstores across the country. I'm going to throw that link into the chat here shortly. And then you can follow that link to purchase the book. And then all proceeds will go directly to Dog Eared Books. Um, so thank you so much for your, for your consideration. Okay, so in just a few moments, Dr. Christopher Willard will sit down with the author, Andrew Jordan Nance, to, dis to discuss mindfulness and what inspired him to write this special book. Next, Andrew will read The Barefoot King, and then we'll close out with a question and answer session. So throughout the event, if you guys want to put in your questions into that Q&A box down near the bottom of the screen, um, so as things come to you and you'd like to ask the question to the author, post them there in that q and I'll see them and then near the end of the event, we'll have a chance to ask those questions to the author. Okay, so without further ado, <laughs> let's, let's meet our authors. Great. Um, and I just wanted to give you uh, all a heads up as to who Chris is. I have a little bio here I'd like to read. Uh, Dr. Christopher Willard is a psychologist and educational consultant specializing in mindfulness. He has been practicing meditation for 20 years and leads workshops nationally and internationally. He currently serves on the board of directors at the Institute for Meditation and Psychotherapy and is the president of the, or the former president of the Mindfulness and Education Network. He teaches at Harvard Medical School and is a best-selling author of many books, including Raising Resilience, Alpha Breaths, Breathing Makes It Better, and most recently, The Breathing Book. All amazing books. I think I have most of them. I, I have to say I don't have all of them yet, but I will, I will get them uh, tomorrow. So, um, and uh, you know what, I'll just read my own bio. Um, I was the conservatory director in San Francisco at the New Conservatory Theater Center for almost 20 years, and then I went on to find, found Mindful Art San Francisco, a program of the San Francisco Education Fund, bringing volunteer mindfulness instructors to San Francisco's Unified School District students. And this year we trained over 50 volunteers, so I'm really, really proud of all of them and, and what they've uh, been able to do. Um, so yeah, so Chris and I are just going to have a little conversation about mindfulness, and I thought we could just kind of go back and forth. And uh, Chris, I'll ask you, how has your mindfulness practice been sustaining you during these last three months? <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question, and I right? think yeah. probably one that we're, we're all thinking about a lot these days as we try to work from home and turn our, our jobs around and some of us becoming um, homeschooling teachers at the same time and all these other things. And, and it's been incredibly important for me just as, as a family. We do a little practice in the morning with my kids. Um, I just, you know, in these moments in the day, which feel fleeting and few and far between, just to remember my breath, to just remember, just to notice sounds and and even just you know I'm, I'm used to spending a lot of time traveling and just to travel around my neighborhood and just really these days to just really more deeply appreciating the beauty around me of what's close by and nice. smelling the roses and noticing just you know what's what's happening as you know springtime and, and rolling into summer just with a bit more mindful awareness has just really helped me sustain myself and, and see the beauty and uh it's it's been so helpful i feel so I grateful to have 20 years of practice up till now yeah how about I'm, you well um yeah i've been trying to meditate in the morning but also like you're saying really trying to find those moments of mindfulness throughout the day the dog walks uh mm -hmm. i do about three dog walks a day so i try to make those as mindful as possible you know i leave my phone at home and just kind of look around the neighborhood, feel my feet on the sidewalk and, and that sort of thing. I'm curious, and I bet some of the people in the audience are curious, 
um, what does a family meditation look like in the morning? What is? I think it depends a lot on your family. Uh, yeah. Just but I guess put that out there. And with a two-year-old and a five-year-old, it might look different than with a, a 15-year-old and an 18-year-old. So, so really with us, we, we really try to just maintain a sense of ritual, which I think when the world feels out of control and unpredictable, it's so important for us ourselves and for families to make things as predictable as possible. It really helps kids feel safe and secure and not have to worry about what's coming next and us too. And so often we'll do a little family meeting and we'll, we'll do a little practice in the morning, you know, whether that's, you know, just noticing what's beautiful in the room around us or doing some goofy hot chocolate breaths or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then ending the day with roses and thorns, talking about the, the highs and lows of our day and doing a little bit of a gratitude practice. And, and that's really what it looks like in our family. And I'm sure it'll grow and evolve as the kids, as the kids grow and change too. So. I, I love that. I was going to mention roses and thorns as something I would suggest for families to do. And, and for those of you who don't know, roses is basically saying what was, uh, was uh, pleasing about the day. And then the thorn is what's unpleasant about the day. And I just learned someone actually at, at a Zoom workshop I was doing recently said, what about buds? And I said, well, what are buds? And they said, a hope for the next day. So we've integrated oh, buds in and I just, it's been a wonderful addition to our little evening ritual. Oh, I love that. That's a great, that's a great thing to think about, like an intention for the next day. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, so, uh, boy, this is all so different than we imagined, of course. Um, but I wanted to share with you a little bit about the um, how I came up with the idea of this book. And um, it's basically just coming from the idea that so many little things throughout our day can throw us off, right? Um, you know, from driving to being in a supermarket to having a conversation with a partner or a friend or a colleague. Um, you know, we, we often feel rudderless without mindfulness. And um, so the book is, is sort of a, a primer into what life can be like when we uh, choose a mindful path. Um, and I'll get into um, the quote that, uh, that inspired me at the end of the reading. Um, so, um, so why don't we just start? How about that? Let's do it. So I'll hold up the book and, yeah. and you'll yeah. read it, I yeah. think. And I've got and it. You'll have to do this for me next time I have a book. Come out. I love it. That sounds good. <laughs> this is I just great. It. The pictures are absolutely stunning. Yeah. Olivia Holden is the woman who uh, did the illustrations and she lives in England and uh, really did a lovely job. Okay, here we go. Long ago, there was a young king named Crete. In his land, people walked with bare feet. King Crete was smart, but had a wandering mind. He was always tripping on things he would find. Look at that, he's tripping over that rug. That poor cat is scared to death. <laughs> One day, he left the palace to take a walk alone. Distracted by birds, he stubbed his toe on a stone. The king yelled, ow, and kicked the rock. He hopped home in pain and in shock. There he goes, hopping all the way home, back to the palace. That night, he tossed, tumbled, and turned. You see all those rocks floating in the sky above his head? Those are all little pebbles floating in the sky. The image of that rock returned and returned. And see his toe? Can you see? Can they see his toe? Look at all his, <laughs> look at all those toes. I don't know if you've ever hurt your toe, but sometimes it feels really good to keep it outside of the covers. <laughs> all right, let's turn the page. <clears throat> In the morning, he woke with a plan and let out a cry. He called to his ministers. I have an idea to try. The ministers listened to the king's every word. They couldn't believe the idea that they'd heard. I wonder what it is. Let's take a breath and turn the page. I stubbed my 
foot while out on a walk. This must never happen again, he continued to talk. I order you to cover this great land with leather. Nobody's feet shall get hurt. We'll be safe forever. Look at their faces. Let's, let me sh let's show their faces. Do you see the faces of the ministers? They're like, this king is crazy. And, and look at the cat below, even the cat. If you, if, I love what Olivia did. If you can tell, the cat's got one eye on the king and it's like, dude, I don't know. I don't know about you. Let's see. Let's see what happens next. His ministers, uh, let's see, did I say everything I wanted to say? Um, yes, yes. His ministers scratched their heads and traded baffled shrugs, then went in search of leather, coats, curtains, and rugs. And look at this poor dog. He's taking a nap and the minister is like, nope, we need that, we need that leather. And the, one of the other ministers is going to a closet and pulling out leather coats. One of the other ones is taking a fabric or leather fabric off of the curtains. Oh my gosh, they're just taking leather from everywhere. His people sewed the leather together one scrap at a time. For months they stitched patches with needles and twine. All right, let's turn the page. <clears throat> Then they rolled out the leather all across the land, on fields, up cliffs, down hills, over sand. The ministers oversaw the covering of each street, hoping this solution would calm down King Crete. Look at all that leather. You know what, let's show them the, the skinny cows. I think that's actually really, See those poor cows? They, they're not able to eat anything. They're just getting the little weeds that might be growing up between the, the leather. All right, let's turn the page. When the leather was finally laid all about, the king felt better until he heard people shout. All of the kingdom came to yell and complain. Their fields could no longer catch any rain. Look at all those angry people. Mad at that inexperienced king. Boy, that's a big protest. All right, let's turn the page, see what happens next. The plants could no longer get water to grow. There was not one flower at the flower show. Look at all those dead plants at the flower show. Do you see that? There's not a flower on any of them. The leather on the streets was terribly hot and slippery when wet, believe it or not. Look at that. Everyone's fanning themselves or, or slipping on the rain. They did not invent umbrellas back then. So no one had any umbrellas. All right, let's see what happens next. <clears throat> Young King Crete knew he had to make things right. He woke his ministers in the middle of the night. He pleaded with them to find a new resolution. One of his wisest ministers had a solution. I wonder which one it is. Ah, this one. She calmly said, it is unwise to cover this land with leather. We can no more control the earth than we can the weather, right? We can't control that lightning storm out there. You are young, my king, but since the beginning of time, people have worked to train their wandering minds. Instead of trying to fix what makes you squirm, Train your mind to be more aware, calm, and firm. Do you see that? He's remembering all the things that happen. There are the birds. There's the stones. There, there he is hopping home. There's all the leather and the skinny cows. People slipping. With practice, you will soon notice the stones in your path. You may still trip 
but instead of getting angry, you'll laugh. <clears throat> Life's challenges are not going to go away, but we can learn to be more skillful every day. Instead of covering each mountain and street, let's simply put the leather right on our feet. There he is imagining all the workers putting leather on his feet. He really doesn't have that big a feet, but he, I think he thinks he's, he's grander than he is. All right, let's take a breath and turn the page. <clears throat> The young king gasped. The ministers became very afraid. A brilliant idea, he exclaimed. And that's how shoes were made. And let's turn the page and see what happens on the very last page. And there's our young king wearing his first pair of shoes. Look at all those stones in his path but he's just smiling away, not a care in the world because he's learned to protect himself from some of the harms along the path that he's chosen. And if you look carefully, there's the flower show on the right. The flowers are back in bloom and there's lots of leather rugs for sale on the left side of the page. The end, or maybe it's the beginning. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Chris. Teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> you know, I was, as I was reading that, I was like, well, this is a stone in our path, you know, and we can either laugh about it or we can get mad. And I'm choosing to laugh about it. Um, and, and the quote that I wanted to share with all of you is this beautiful quote by a old, old um, uh, monk from India, his name was Shanti Deva. And this is the quote, where would I find enough leather to cover the entire surface of the earth? But with leather soles beneath my feet, it's as if the whole world has been covered. So that's what mindfulness is for me. Rather than trying to fix everything in my path so I can be happy, I try to train my mind to look for the good, first of all, find the pleasant in the present, and then try to use my breath to help my, calm my mind and my body down if I'm feeling uh, overwhelmed by the challenges in my way. Um, and I wanted to tell you a story about Shanti Deva. He uh, was a monk long ago, and he, he went to school in a monastery, and all the other monks thought of him as kind of slow. Um, they really kind of made fun of him, in front of him, behind his back. They actually weren't very nice monks to this, this Shanti Deva. So one day, one of them said, hey, Shanti Deva, why don't you come speak to the monks? Give us, give us your wisdom, if you will. So he was like, okay, sure. So they all snickered as they wandered off. And then he came in and he gave the most beautiful speech. It's called The Way of the Bodhisattva. And it had this passage about putting leather on your feet. And at the very end, the story goes, and I don't know if this is true, but he floated off into the clouds and was never seen again. So you can imagine the faces of those monks as he floated off after giving this beautiful, wise speech about mindfulness and kindness and compassion and equanimity, which is a fancy word for balance. Um, so do I have any questions? Let's see, let me see if I've got any questions. Um, I don't see any uh, questions yet. Yes, we do have a few, and I don't okay. know if you can see them. Um, okay. But well, why don't you I, ask me them? Yeah. Why don't you ask me them? Okay, great. Yeah. So thank you again, guys. I'm sorry for the video um, uh, problems that we're having tonight. 
but thank you all for for rolling with this you are the best audience ever um so way in the beginning of the discussion um you guys you and chris had talked about hot chocolate breasts oh yes could right. you please explain a little bit more yeah. about what that absolutely is? so you basically just hold up an imaginary cup of hot chocolate and you breathe in that beautiful smell through your nose and then you breathe out through your mouth to cool down the hot chocolate you do that i'd say three to five times but nice and slow you don't want to breathe too fast i really encourage breath work to be done slowly rather than fast because when we take deep breaths we tell our bodies and our hearts that we're safe so really remember that as you're practicing breath work thank you andrew here's another one um, well, a few actually folks okay. were wondering what is the um, age range for this book? Sure. I would say, you know, it's such a beautiful book. I hate to limit it, but I would say as low as four years old, just because there's so many beautiful things to look at. And as, as old as 104, but probably eight or, or nine. That's, that's my estimation but i i have a friend who i went over to visit for a socially distant party and uh i had given him the book and he had put it on his coffee table you know it's 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 such a pretty book i don't think it should be put on a shelf i think it should be displayed proudly because olivia did such a beautiful job it's gorgeous andrew my, my two-year-old daughter just couldn't stop looking at the pictures just oh, kept goodness. flipping through whether she could understand the words is another thing but she just loved the oh, pictures and my my five-year-old also loved the story i love it thank you for saying that chris cool great thank you um a funny question that we got from philip is there okay. a running version of the shoes is there a running version of the shoes? Oh, probably because I'm a runner, I'm guessing. I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know that, probably. Yes, there's a running version of the shoes, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So um, a, another question, what inspired the name of the king, Crete? Yeah, um, well, it had to rhyme with the word before it. Um, and actually, <laughs> Uh, let's see, and the word was feet. <laughs> um, and I actually, we played around with different words. Um, and I thought about Preet, P-R-E-E-T, um, but we settled on Crete and, and I like the name. It, it kind of reminds me of, of Greece, which um, is, an ancient, is an ancient civilization, one of the oldest in the Mediterranean. Um, and uh, so anyway, that's why we chose it. Great. Um, another question. Do you write every day or just when the ideas strike you? Are you in a writer's group? Oh, yes. Um, yes, I am in a writer's group and I wanted to do a shout out to them. It was one of my on my things to do. Uh, I'm in a writer's group and we meet monthly. And I have to say, having this writer's group for all you uh, aspiring authors or authors out there is really fantastic. It really kind of keeps you on the alert for uh, stories that uh, kind of could be percol percolating in your head. Um, so just like, just on, I think, Thursday, I had an idea and I thought, oh, I'm gonna see my authors uh, on Zoom on Monday, so I'm gonna write it down. And it turned into a story and, and it's got some finessing to do, but yeah, um, I write about, I write when the, the uh, mood hits me, but I also, kind of am hyper aware that I've got this author's group to, uh, to bring work to. Wonderful. Um, an, a, another question to Andrew, how has your acting training informed your interest and in study of mindfulness? Oh, that's a great question. Boy, that person knows me. Um, yes, <laughs> I feel like mindfulness training and theater training are very, very similar. Both ask the participant to be present, to be in the moment, to uh, use your breath to handle skillful emotions, to notice where emotions are in your body, where they live in your body, so you can kind of finesse them to uh, 
be your best self, whether it's a character or, you know, your actual, you know, real life persona. Um, I feel like they, they diverge when um, we talk about reactivity versus uh, responsiveness. I think an actor does want to be reactive. There, there's an expression in theater, acting is reacting. But with mindfulness, you want to be able to respond, um, respond wisely, in fact. So you want that pause of awareness, like, you're, oh, I'm having a big emotion. I could really be reactive and mean right now, but I'm going to try to take a breath and make a better choice so I have less to feel bad about. Great, thank you. Um, another, why did you decide to write your books in rhyme? Great question. Um, you know, I like the create, creative aspect of it. Um, you know, quite frankly, a lot of editors will say, you know, don't bother um, because it limits your market overseas. Um, so if you feel, if, if there's any authors out there who feel like, oh gosh, I've really got to rhyme, all the books I remember from childhood rhyme, um, I wouldn't worry about it. I would just stick to a great story and just um, work with that. Um, it's fun to rhyme, but it's not necessary. Great. Um, another question about um, the illustrator. Yeah. So this person says, this is a new illustrator for you. How did you find her? Right. Well, little known fact is usually um, illustrators and authors uh, don't uh, actually meet. Um, often a publishing house will say, okay, we love your text and now we're going to go find the illustrator. Um, sometimes you can partner with an illustrator, uh, which I did with Puppy Mind and The Lion in Me. Um, and, but that's actually rare. I know Chris has, has partnered with some people who've done the illustrations for him, but often you really don't know who they're gonna choose until you see some of the sketches. What's great is I, I did get to see all of the sketches before it went to print. So I gave feedback, um, you know, I'd say on every page I had some thought about it, but I thought, Olivia just was on the right track from the get-go and just a few things needed to be uh, changed in my opinion. And, and they took some of the, my advice and, and they, they discarded others. So it, it, was, it was a really great uh, collaboration. Okay, great. So, so this next question is kind of a two-parter. I'm gonna combine a few um, um, questions that people have. So okay. the first is, how should kids start out with mind, uh, mindfulness and meditation? Right. And then, do you have a favorite mindfulness exercise that you do with kids? Oh, sure, yeah. Um, well, start small, uh, you know, 30 seconds of um, sitting. I play a fun game that I didn't create, but, I, but it is in my book, Mindful Arts in the Classroom, called Puppy Mind Games. And it's basically um, seeing if the kids can sit still for one whole minute without, uh, you know, itching or twitching. Um, and, you know, you have to decide whether your kid is up for it. But um, it's a super fun game, especially in a classroom setting. They really like to kind of get a little competitive with one another. Um, and I encourage them to use their breath, to wiggle their toes. And I wish you could see my hands, but just simple hand movements, like, like put your hands up like, a, like two uh, flower petals. And with every breath, just open your hands and then close your hands as you breathe out. So breathing in, opening your hands and closing your hands. Some sort of small activity uh, with the hands is a great way to keep the kids engaged uh, because their puppy minds are really strong and they are going to wander off, you know, um, you know, it's, and then the other idea is what I like to do sometimes is lift my toes with every breath. So you breathe in and you lift your toes and you breathe out. What I like about that is it really connects me back down to my body because often we have so much tension in our legs and our hips and our lower backs. 
uh, because we're so up in our heads all day, that that's a nice way to almost give yourself a little body scan. So those are, those are some things that I, I can think of. But I actually, if you go to my website, mindfulartssf.org, you can look at some breathing cards I sell, uh, 50 different ways to breathe. And uh, there's different ways from like Spidey breathing to Wonder Woman breathing, uh, elephant breathing, that sort of thing. And then Chris, I don't know if Chris is still on, but Chris, you've got some cards as well, right? I'm here. Yep. Got some cards. Yeah. With just little short practices. And as, as you said, Andrew, just these little breathing practices, I think are so fun and bringing, bringing movement in, right? Whether it's butterflies or... Yep alligators or mm. um, the hot chocolate um, and our bodies. I love that kind of lifting our toes up. I was doing that as you were asking us to, and I, I just love that practice. It's a wonderful one. So thank it's, you for, for sharing that. It's so simple. And, you know, it's a great thing to do before like giving a speech, you know, when you're kind of floating and you're like, oh gosh, I hope I remember to say everything. Um, so it's a really good, or if you're starting to get uh, triggered or agitated, um, you know, in a conversation, it's a really good way to just check in with the body um, so you don't kind of flip into fight, flight, or freeze. Did I answer both questions? I can't remember. Did I get them? Yeah, I think so. I think you did. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so there, I just want to get your feeling. There's like uh, 10 or so more questions. Oh, goodness. Okay. Do you, are you okay with answering a few more questions? Should we... Um, uh, rounded out around seven, or I'm sorry, um, six ten or so. Yeah, let's go to six ten. How about that? Okay, great. Okay, so guys, if if you have questions, please get them in there to that Q and A box. Okay, so um, another question: How long about does it take you to write a story like this? Good question. Um, well, I can write the initial story very quickly. You know probably like an hour or two to write that initial story. And then it takes probably a few weeks of sharing it with my author's group, um, talking to the editor, um, going back and forth in that way. Uh, and then of course the illustrations uh, come into play late in the game. And that takes, I'd say about three months is, is my recollection um, of back and forth and that sort of thing. Um, so it's about a year long process, uh, at least that's been my experience of doing four books. It's about a year of, of back and forth and then you've got to send the book off to the publisher. Would you agree, Chris? Sorry, just unmuting myself. Yeah, it's been, it's, it's really different. You know, I wrote Alpha Breaths with Daniel in about 15 minutes and then right. um, actually the book I did with Bala, Breathing Makes It Better, took... Um, a number of years of, of back and forth and you know so it's it's everywhere in between and yeah. Then, um, yeah it's it's such a fascinating surprising process and been a little bit different every time for me yeah yeah you yeah, know yeah just when you think okay this is how it's done someone does it totally <laughs> different and you're like okay well <laughs> I'll go with it <laughs> yeah good any other questions Great. Um, so here's one. Do you have any plans for writing a book for middle school kids? You know, I actually think this book um, has a, a, a sort of a sophisticated quality to it. Um, and some of the other stories in Mindful Arts in the Classroom are quite sophisticated. They're old folk tales from different parts of the world, including India and Africa and um, Native, there's one Native American story as well. Um, but the short answer is no, but I do think, you know, if you give um, middle schoolers the agency to maybe read the book out loud, maybe act it out. I've heard Puppy Mind turn into raps uh, as well. Um, so I think middle schoolers, you know, if you give them the tools, will kind of run with it and they could create a play out of a lot of the uh, and the barefoot king would be a great play or 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 film really and andrew i can imagine this being read by by adults at the end of a, a yoga class or before a meditation wisdom Not talk or something like that it's 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 so profound and you know obviously the shanti davis story is but then you've really 
created this this wonderful story out of it. I, I really feel like that's true of a lot of your books too, are just as applicable for us adults as they are for kids. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I I I would like to humbly say I pride myself on creating books that have a sophistication to them that that can appeal to not only little kids, but you know, big kids too. Great. Um, let's see here. A lot of people had really nice comments about how they just loved the book. Oh, thank you, everyone. We'll make sure that um, the authors read those. Okay. Uh, I guess it is almost 10 after six, so maybe a really good closing question could be, yeah. okay. um, what is next? What right. are you writing right next? Well, yeah, well, I'm always writing something. I, I um, you know, I have so many books that I've written that I, some I've sent to publishers, some I haven't. Um, you know, I'm sort of at the mercy, an author is really at the mercy of a publisher unless they decide to self-publish, which I haven't chosen to do at this point. So um, just, yeah, just kind of waiting to see who, what publishers are interested. Um, I'm not too active in sending them out. I, I want to be really selective because I, I want to make sure I have kind people in my life. Um, uh, Bala Kids, Shambhala uh, Publications are a wonderful organization to work with, so I'm really grateful for them. Um, but, you know, I have a dolphin book out there that I really love, that I'd love to share with the world. I've got one about uh, protesting in uh, challenging times um, and being an ally. Um, oh my gosh. So, oh, I've got one about just living in a wound up world and how we all need to slow down, um, which I really, really love. I think it's very unusual too. Um, and that actually doesn't rhyme. Um, so, so yeah, that's what I'm up to. And I, I, since, since I've got the floor, I'm just going to, um, just send out some thank yous. Um, first to Dr. Chris Willard, you are so busy and yet you are so kind and so available to me and to others. And I, I just really sort of honor you. Thank you. Um, to Bala Kids, to my children's author group, to the Buddhist book group I belong to that brought Shanti Deva's quote to me, to my husband, my family and friends. I feel supported by you every day. And um, to the people who like my books and who see the value in them, I can't do this without you. And also to the San Francisco Education Fund, which gave me my start in teaching mindfulness. Um, and, and now, you know, we're seeing so many kids every year using my books and curriculum that I've written. So thank you all for coming. I wish I could see you. I wish you could see me. But uh, there's my picture. So that's basically me on a good day <laughs> with good lighting. And um, please spread the word about the books, uh, especially The Barefoot King. And I hopefully will see you all soon and get to give you uh, not just virtual hugs, but real hugs. I'm clapping for everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. We appreciate you, your time and your questions. And um, yes, thank you again. And I, I hope everyone has a great night.